Well, good evening, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 56. We have another excellent show for you today. Jennifer Perrine is here. Um, she's on the line and will be joining us in just a second. Um, before we begin, I should say Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuation, continuous publication not continuation, since uh, 1995, and uh, we just do it for the love of poetry. Um, if you love poetry like we do, please click the like button and share and do all that good stuff that tells computers that uh, you like what you see, because if you like what we see, then more people will see it. And um, I should say before we start that all poems and essays are works of the imagination, while the perceptions and insights are Based on the author's experiences, no reference to any real person is intended or should be inferred. Now, the reason why I say that is because um, you'll find out in just a minute. Um, tonight's prompt poem, um, if you have one, is um, write a poem based on a famous painting. And because of that, I thought that um, the poem we should do tonight um, is one of my favorite poems we've published. Um, because it's about a famous painting. It's about The Kiss by Gustav Klint. And um, it's by Heather Bell. And let's get a, um, let's look at this poem. This is our warm-up poem today by Heather Bell. Oops, this is um, Love by Heather Bell. And there's no audio, so I'll have to read it myself. The truth about Klimt is, when he painted The Kiss, he was also beating his beautiful wife. He beat her with one hand and painted with the other he got two sad blisters on his right palm from this. His wife sometimes slowly pulled up the roots to his favorite willows and cut them delicately and then buried them again. He jokes, that's what I get for marrying a woman from a sanitarium. But she was from Vienna. They met on the street. He stopped her and she believed and his eyes said, I do not want to die, do not let me die. So she touched his face there in the street as a person touches a comma on a page after they have returned home from a place that has no commas. On their wedding night, she ran him a lukewarm bath and his testicles looked like overripe plums. He raped her until a low moan seemed to come from the walls, as if the wolves were angry and coming, and Klimt went to bed forcefully, and his wife went to bed with dirty blood around her nostrils and mouth. It goes on like this for years, just as it goes on for years for everyone who marries someone they cannot love. You step, body over body, into the kitchen to kiss your sweat and rot good morning. Let me tell you something, she says on the day that he paints the kiss, and he hits her in the head before she can remember the something. She thinks it might have been important. It might have been something. When he shows the painting to his friends, they say he must be the most romantic man in the world, and she nods. And the man in the painting pushes the woman down further, flows into her, gold and angry, and her eyes are shut, and they do not look clenched, and this is puzzling but no one else seems to notice. That was Heather Bell, our warm-up poem for today from Rattle number 31. And this poem, as mentioned, is one of my favorite poems. It's uh, written after The Kiss, um, which I should put on screen for you to see if you're not familiar with um, The Kiss. This is it right here. Um, here we go. This is The Kiss by Klimt. And um, the thing about this poem, it's one of my favorite poems we've ever published. But um, it's not true. And <laughs> it's such a fascinating thing to, um, to, th to think about this poem. We, when we accepted it, I thought, like, I never knew Clint was abusive. <laughs> and, um, and then I looked it up, and um, he's not. Um, I mean, I assume he's not. Um, he never married. And the painting is about um, someone who's, de who's um, referred to as his lifelong companion. But they were never married, like, like he mentions in the poem or like Heather Bell, I should say, mentions in the poem. And um, so it's just a weird thing. Like, I, um, I wonder how many people out there think that Gustav Klimt is a terrible human being now because of that poem. But it's such a fascinating interpretation of the painting, and um, such a well-written poem by Heather Bell, who I think is one of the, the best poets writing today, honestly. She's one of those strange people who... Um, doesn't publish much and um, isn't all that well known outside of Rattle. I think we published her about a dozen times, but um, other poet or other, she doesn't publish much else. And um, we published her poem, um, um, 
Kill the Dogs, or her chapbook, Kill the Dogs, is one of the rattle chapbook prize winners. You can check that out. That's Heather Bell, though, uh, with The Kiss. And I just, I don't know. I always think about that poem and um, wonder about the morality of publishing that and if people understand that it's, um, um, you know, a poet's imagination or not. So at the end of the show, we'll be doing our open mic, as always, and, um, and, and we'll... Um, share some poems about um, paintings, which is the prompt for today. And you can always call in 818-850-7727. Let it ring a few times, and I will call you back. Or you can uh, send me a chat message over Skype at Rattle Poetry, all one word, if you would like to share your prompt poem at the end of the night. But now, today's poet, as I said, is uh, Jennifer Perrine, and she's the author of this book that's just come out um, again. I'll put it on screen here. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful cover, and the book came out today is the official release date, which is the first time I think we've ever um, had a poet on the day of their release. Um, she's also the author of um, three previous books of poetry, most recently No Confessions, No Moss, now winner of the Publishing Triangle Audrey Lord Award and the Prairie Schooner Book Prize. Her other books include In the Human Zoo, which was selected for the um, Aga Shahid Ali Poetry Prize, and The Body is No Machine. She's the re- recipient of fellowships from Literary Arts and the Vermont Studio Center. She lives in Portland, Oregon. And uh, here she is, Jennifer Perrine. Hey, Jennifer, how you doing? Good. How are you, Tim? I'm doing great. And congratulations on your book release. It's the first time in a year that we've had a poet the day that the book comes out. So it's cool to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, what is like? What is it like having a book release during you know in the age of COVID? Is there anything even going on, or um, how is it uh, going? Yeah, it's. I tried to sort of celebrate a little bit today, and it felt very strange to even attempt it. But um, we're still doing. We're doing a virtual book launch next week and mm-hmm. trying to do some some readings. But um, it definitely feels different than the previous books, both both because of access to you know, venues and places, and also just the spirit of like, to what degree do I want to celebrate? Mm -hmm. uh, And to what extent do I want to honor what's going on in everybody else's life right now? That's uh, challenging in lots of different ways. Yeah, well, it's a celebration here. So congratulations. And and let's celebrate this book. Um, So do you want to start out by reading something um, to sort of kick it off and, and have people have an idea of what it's about and what it's like? Sure. Yeah. Um, So I don't think this is necessary to understand the poems, but I think it's helpful context to know that um, all of these poems in one way or another are riffing off of words that um, were used or have been used by Donald Trump in either overused or misused in different ways. And so um, one of the first poems I think I wrote for the book was uh, off the word build. So this is build. And it's on page 14. Uh, Okay, thanks. Yeah, go ahead whenever you're, you're ready. Build. They built a bower. We were not allowed to rest in its shade. We built a tower that loomed over their crops. Sun starved. They built a machine, planted it in our fields, painted it green so we would not see it snatching our feasts from beneath their feet. We built a god that hooked its jaws through their children. They built a new universe. We watched them go, built gardens in their ruins. We grew restless, built a rocket. Inside, we travel across galaxies looking for their land. We build each day new ways to make them come home. We build up our hopes that this time they'll stay. Thanks. And that was Build from uh, one of the first poems Jennifer wrote from um, her new book, Again. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about the creation of this book? It's it's an interesting, um, you know, what it reminded me of reading it um, last night was uh, Mathia Harvey's book, uh, Modern Life, which has the terror of future and the future of terror, that wonderful sequence about um, um, sort of post 9-11, you know, Patriot Act, world and all that stuff um there's a weird way that it's like 
the 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 words that inspired the poems i as i imagine are so different from sort of the content of the poems there's like mm-hmm. a sh- there it's a really interesting book to read um, do you want to talk a little bit about how it came to be yeah so after trump's election i was uh, pretty you know disillusioned and uh, disoriented and angry and afraid and lots of other things and i was trying to find something to latch onto um to sort of ground myself in the chaos that I was feeling. And I uh, felt like the one thing that I knew I had control over was my writing and, and to some extent language. And so um, I thought if, if, if I could influence something, it would be how maybe these words are thought about or remembered. And so there were a lot of words that I was just hearing repeated over and over. And I was starting to lose the connotations that I once had for them. Um, Like of, the word build, um, you know, might have implied for me uh, a lot of things about home or um, land and gardens and um, abundance, things that um, I think have to do with my family and my upbringing. And so slowly they were getting erased by hearing the phrase build the wall over and over. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I was thinking about each of these words, I really tried to kind of dive into um, both sort of personal stories that I may have for them and also just the like the dictionary defini- definitions of the words themselves um, things that I was starting to forget that these words also meant and to try to write those back into the poems in some way so um, so I wrote a poem a day for the first hundred days of Trump's presidency and hmm. those uh, kind of got called down into what became the book oh wow that's interesting so these were all written like right at the beginning and, and really and, and that's really interesting project to do i noticed looking at the acknowledgments that it seems like none of the poems if i unless i'm wrong are published um in any other magazine this is the first time anybody is reading these is that true uh, so to keep myself accountable as i was doing this um i published each one on my like my website which i don't think anybody was looking at <laughs> but <laughs> But it was a way for me to just kind of stay honest with myself that I would just write something that day. And even if it wasn't good, it was still a sort of meditative act. Um, And uh, yeah, I ended up because I posted them all on my own website. uh, Most journals wouldn't Mm -hmm. um, consider them, which was fine. At at the time, I was not writing for publication. I was just writing to kind of for therapy, mostly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. And yeah, so the, the book itself, um, if people didn't read these, like on my website, they're, they're brand new. Yeah, that's interesting. I should say the website um, is jenniferperine.org, which is exactly how you'd think. It's Jennifer and then P-E-R-R-I-N-E dot org if you want to find Jennifer's website and, and all those poems too. Are they still up? Did you leave them up? The, 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 you know, publishing is... I pulled them down right yeah, before see, I wondered. the book was published because I, I thought, <laughs> you know people ought to buy the book and see them. I think it's, I think it's useful to have them kind of as an archive of all 100 poems. Um, but I think they make more sense now as mm-hmm. a book now that I've ordered them and sequenced them and all that. Stuff. Yeah. The modern publishing world. I mean, we're just in such a transition with the, the ability to share poems through social media and through your website. Like we, um, the, um, Rosemary Traumer episode, she just completely has abandoned publication and only mm. she reads, she writes a poem every day. She publishes on her website um, and um, she reads it now through, you know, technology like this. Um, and so, so the idea, which as a, as a publisher of a literary magazine, I'm a little afraid of, is that, <laughs> that people will um, no longer find any, you know, value in poetry magazines or literary magazines. But, um, oh. but there's so many options and, um, and there's so much to do. Um, did, did you think about making this a book before it became a book or was it just sort of you were doing this was it an organic process or did you think like when did you realize you had a book here that's it was um so about halfway or maybe a little bit earlier into the the project i uh, had a fellowship at vermont studio center um which was just happened to be um, coincidental timing and while i was there it was the first time i started sharing the poems outside of on my website and so i would share them with other writers who were there and a couple of them were like, you know, this might be a book. And I was like, no, it's just, it's something I just need to get out. It's, uh, um, 
not really meant to be published. And they were like, no, go back, go, go try to like turn this into a book. And so, um, I probably waited. So I finished writing the poems in like April, I guess it would have been. And then waited like six months and came back to it. And I was like, Oh, they, they were right. There's, there's a book here. Uh Yeah. Yeah. And was there a, uh, what was the process of publishing it like was um um this because it's a beautiful book I'll, I'll share it on screen again for everybody but but the production of this is just amazing um it's a beautiful cover art and then um just throughout the book and then on the inside there are a lot of little just wonderful little design choices too they did such a good job can you talk a little bit about um ariel press and um yeah or airly press is that how you'd say it airly yeah airly yeah, so this is this is also kind of a new venture for me. So um, all my previous books were published through university presses, and this one, because it was sort of a like just a different kind of book, um, like a project book, um, I was trying to figure out a good home for it. And Early Press is a is a local um, independent press in Portland, and they're a collective. Um, so. Um, all of the poets who are published also become editors for several years and contribute to the work of the press. And so, um, I guess it was 2018, they, um, you know, accepted my book for publication. And then I, over the last couple of years, helped to publish other people's work, which was really great because I got to learn a lot about the publication process that I didn't necessarily know before. Um, and it helped me prepare for when this book was kind of in the works where, um, I worked with a designer named Beth Ford, um, who she really is, should be credited with kind of er- everything that looks good in the book because, um, you know, she came up with a cover design with all those little internal details. And, um, it was great because it was a really, uh, collaborative process in a way that, um, I mean, I really appreciated the processes for my previous books because somebody else just kind of handled it all. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one was great in that I got to sort of see see the designer in action and look at all the different ideas that she had and kind of be able to contribute um, what I thought might be a good direction for it. Yeah, it's really cool. It's such a great publishing model, I think, that co- cooperative press. The, the one I'm most familiar with is 16 Rivers out of San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, but seeing how beautiful this book came out... Um, is just, I think it's a great way to do um, publishing. Um, I should say that, that if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to pass them along in the chat window, either on um, Facebook or YouTube. I'm not looking at Periscope and Twitter because I can only have so many windows open at once, but I'm looking at <laughs> Facebook and YouTube. And um, um, Faye Srala asks, um, she says, I like the artwork. Uh, what was the inspiration for the cover art? And how did that come to be? It's just, it's, it's a beautiful cover. I mean, this Ouroboros and the again, um, and how did the title come to be too? How did that all sort of merge? I was curious because it is such a beautiful book and cover. Yeah. So the, maybe I'll start with the title first. Um, so the, the, as I was writing these poems for the project, I knew at least at a certain point that the last four words I was going to write about were make America great. And again, um, and so once I had written those and as I was forming it into a book, I thought um, the word again felt like the right title, both because it was used in a poem, but also because um, I had come to recognize how much of the, the um, political and social perspectives that um, I think we've seen emerge over the last four years are cyclical and they repeat over and over and so when I um, shared the manuscript with Beth, Beth the designer, she um, she took a look at, at the poems and she came back with a couple different iterations of the cover. And none of them were, were this, but one of them had that, um, the, the sort of swirl, I don't know what to call this thing, but the, the, the swirling arrow with the word again in it, I said, you know, that has to be part of the cover. So she sort of just kept tinkering with it and trying different um, other kinds of images. Um, and then one day she said, you know, I think I've got it. And she sent me the, the picture of the Ouroboros. And I said, um, you know, that happens to be a, an image that is really, um, I don't know, it, it feels uh, very intimate to me. I have a tattoo of one on my arm. Oh, yeah. it's, <laughs> um, it, it's just been something that I've... Um, long found to be an image that um, makes me think about 
um, the cyclical nature of life and um, the ways in which we um, are both destructive and creative at the same time. And so I felt like she had just sort of pulled all these things together without knowing that these things were personal and important to me and um, made it work. Yeah, it's so interesting that that word again in the, of course, Make America Great Again is, is such a, I mean, that is the, the heart of everything, really. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't for again, it would sort of be okay. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, it would be open to lots of possibilities. It, it really would. Yeah, to something yeah else. it's like yeah. the, you know, it's a turn from optimism to to, to nihilistic pessimism or something. Um, <laughs> do you want to read, I have an, a good question here, but do you want to read one more poem just to... Um, move it along and, and, and share how this book feels. Then I'll ask another question from Richard here. Yeah. Um, I'll read this poem because I think it feels pretty different from the others. It's Deal and it's on page 49. Okay. Deal. My mother dealt in sorrows, passed them out in rounds, face down, so we each received an even hand. She was every queen in the deck. Her men dressed as the one-eyed jacks and the king with the axe, laid behind the back or turned aside to stay blind to her weeping. We each awaited our turn, unsure whether to hold or to cut our loss. We all called, all checked. She never claimed to know the rules, the difference between raise and fold. She only knew the stakes. She placed us her best bets. So that was Deal from um, Jennifer Perrine's new book again. And another good example, they're all good examples, though, of, of what I was talking about before, but the, the leap between, like, when you see the word deal and you know their poems about Trump, you, like, you have something in your head, and then they go into such a, a different place and, and, and this sort of... Um, mythological like distance or something there's something so interesting going on um and that's a great example of that so so richard westheimer asked um could you speak to the to why poetry seems an especially suited way to speak truth in the age of trumpism Mm. i don't know if it's especially suited i think there's lots of other ways but for me it's useful in that um it gives me time to slow down and reflect. I think there's a lot of um, uh, just a lot of ways of speaking to other people right now, either you know through media or directly to other people, um, where we're sort of just responding in the moment through like really intense emotions. And sometimes that's helpful, but for me, um, I really need poetry to to kind of slow my roll a little bit and think about like, how do I actually feel about this when I'm not uh, in the heat of the moment? Um, And so I think that's one way in which it's useful. I think another way is just that for the reader to hopefully it also allows that similar kind of response where it gives them a moment to pause and to just um, take a breath and reflect before they sort of re-engage with whatever kinds of, um, you know, activism or engagement they need to, to, you know, to get through and to change things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, I'm always reminded of the, the two minutes hate in, um, in 1984, like that, that sort of like, mm-hmm. like, we're just on social media, it's just raging, you know, and, and, and it lasts as long as like, we're on Twitter, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, you know, so there's something about the about poetry that does slow it down and make you think about what you're actually feeling rather than just sort of reacting. And because, because I feel like, um, I, and I try, it's so hard to talk about stuff like this because I, I want to be as neutral as possible and not to, cause you know, I'm just a publisher. I'm trying, but, um, uh, but, um, it, it feels like, like Trump is like, like the king of trolling people. And then, and then you get these like reactions of just like outrage, like over and over. It's a cycle that like never ends. And um, is there a way that poetry is like maybe a way to like break the cycle and sort of connect more with your feelings or, or something? I, I don't know. For, yeah, I think for me it is. It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily reduce my anger or 
um, any of the other things that I might feel, but it, it helps me sort of name, like, this is why I feel that way. And this, this is why some of those feelings are valid or where they come from and helps me maybe even put a narrative behind them so that when I'm talking with somebody else, I can, I can both share my perspective and also give them a little bit more entrance to kind of talk about why they might have a different view or understanding because I've had a little more time to like calm myself down and just sort of sit with it. And, um, yeah, I don't know if it works that way for other people, but that's, that's how poetry works for me. <laughs> yeah, I always go back to um, Eric Campbell has his book, Arguments for Stillness. And I feel like that is just the, that's what poetry is really about, is is having time for stillness and meditation and introspection in this world where we're just chopped up into immediate like response and dopamine reactions and yes. just like, bam, bam, bam. Like we're like, I just imagine people... I mean, everybody these days, like myself included, are just like those little mice, like hitting the little lever for the more dopamine in those experiments or whatever. And and poetry is the the antidote to that in a way that it that we just slow down and take a deep breath and um, actually engage with our feelings is is um, something that's that's worthwhile to do. Let's hear another couple poems. Okay. Um, I think in the spirit of going with. Um, the Heather Bell poem that you read earlier. I'll read Dog, which is on page 38. Dog. Do not let me off my leash. Keep me tethered, my gleaming teeth forever in reach. Now you've tamed me. I'll cram my hackle, play the wag. When you shut the door, I'll whine, left behind, but stow all barks and howls, all bays that may offend. For you, I'll keep my snout clean. For you, I'll end the prowl. You've put my wild to work, given me this pristine bowl of water to lap, a groomer to smooth my fur, to comb out the mats. Still, I can't help notice your scent resembles the musk of the one who once called me mutt, kicked me in the gut, sent me panting. Blood crusted where my ear was torn by that cur. His voice, so much like yours, hounds my dreams, shouts mongrel bitch, hunts until I bite, grip tight the bone, shake my head to break the neck. I wake with snarl and slaver, strain against my silver chain. Forgive my poor training, my bad deeds. He was my master, but that is past. You're a different man. Yours is the hand that feeds. And it was dog from... uh... Jennifer Perrine's newest book. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you got into poetry, um, just in general? And and the other thing I was wondering about, um, sort of maybe just in, in relationship to your background, we have those poems we published dating back to like 2007, maybe, um, those home visit poems. Yeah. Um, um, so first of all, I guess this is two questions, but how did you, how did you get into writing poetry and, and where did those home visit poems come from? Is that some personal experience that you had? It's, it's something I've always wondered about you and I've never, never found the answer. Yeah. I would love one day if I could find a book that those home visit poems can go into. Um, so I, um, how did I get started in poetry? Um, I think I had some, I had some early interest in poetry, you know, as, as like a teenager, um, had some high school teachers who introduced me to it. And, um, I remember one teacher in particular, um, I tell this story often when I try to talk about the origins of uh, my interest in poetry, we had read the scarlet letter and she, uh, gave an assignment after the, the, we read the book where you could either write an essay about it or you could write a poem in the, from the perspective of one of the characters in the book. And um, I wrote a poem from the perspective of Pearl, Hester Prynne's daughter. And I just kind of, um, it was the first time that I 
maybe had written a persona poem and there was something about that that was really gratifying and really freeing. And so it was something that I started to do um, just sort of for myself uh, for a couple of years. And then when I was in college, um, I had a kind of weird path through college. I started out um, like studying international relations and religion and then art and kind of kept moving around and um, ended up taking uh, a lot of writing courses in college. And once I left college, um, I didn't do anything with international relations or religion or art, but I kept writing. And so a couple of years went by and I um, realized that this was something that I really um, loved doing. I had started publishing a couple of poems and decided um, had some mentors who helped me get into grad school. And um, so that was sort of where things started. And from there was just um, uh, a deep dive. I fell in love. So, um, and as for those home visit poems, those came out of, um, in the period between um, when I had left college and when I started grad school, I worked for... Um, maybe a year or so as um, an in-home therapist for children with um, in-home and in-school therapist for children with disabilities of different kinds. And um, especially in the homes grew to understand that um, the role that I had uh, intervening or trying to, to help these children in different ways to adapt to um the expectations that especially their schools had for them was was often profoundly disrupted by things that were happening in their home life that I had no control over and had very little influence over. And um, so poems were, those poems were a way for me to kind of reflect on those experiences and the kind of powerlessness I felt in those situations to, um, to change those children's lives for the better, which sounds really bleak, but... Um, I also left that job pretty, you know, after maybe a year because I realized I, I was not the person to do that. I, I suspect that there are other people out there who can, who do have the power to really change, um, change things for children in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. They, I think we published two or three of them maybe back in the, you know, like 10 or 12 years ago. And they did remind me about, I worked as a counselor um, for mentally ill mm. adults. It was a very similar sort of experience i mean much sort of more emotionally powerful i think if it's children which is a different thing altogether but just the the difficulty of trying to help people and and the, the how draining it is to sort of be like like it's one thing to fail at certain things but to fail at that is is such a hard thing to grapple with i think how many of those poems do you have do you have i i assume kind of they were in a book that i hadn't read of yours but i guess not they, they, yeah, they never ended up in a book. I think there were probably about five of them total. Um, and they were, they were going to be in the book in the human zoo. And then in the editorial process, they got removed. And so, um, yeah, I would like to sort of write back into some of that again and revisit it. Um, because it is, um, there was, it was one of, uh, these sort of moments of feeling like, um, I don't know, uh, like a profound sense of failure because I was so attached mm -hmm. to these children, which is probably also a good reason for me to leave yeah. that job. Yeah, um, but yeah. so attached and feeling just like, um, yeah, I think um, writing about them in a fictionalized way and trying to share some of their stories was about the only good that I felt like I could do with that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, from those experiences that I had it with like you had to like certain people had enough of like a wall up that they could deal with it. And then yeah. you know, other people didn't and, and people just, you know, broke down. It was really hard. It's hard work and, and very underpaid too, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, do you want to read a few more poems? Sure. Um, I think I will read. This is America. So this is one of those last few poems, and it's on page 64 and 65. Thanks. America. We claim you as our own, 
stone we heft, cast first and last, no sin, no shame in our past. We tame you, plant this flag that grows in straight rows, keeps watch, blots out weeds that sneak through cracks. We name you, land back that makes us see stars, home of the belt that stripes our backs. Yeah, that's such a, I mean, the, <laughs> the land of the smack that makes us see stars, home of the belt that stripes our backs. What's some some lines there? I was wondering, reading these, you have a bunch of these poems in the um, in the book that um, are just one word per line. Um, uh, what what was that? How did you make that choice? So um, here's where I reveal a really ridiculous uh, procedural part of my process, which um, this came out of feeling like. I, uh, that time period when I was writing all of these was just utter chaos. And I um, needed some, both needed some control and also um, wanted to acknowledge how random life felt right then. And so um, part of the process of writing these every morning, I would uh, get out a, a set of like Dungeons and Dragons dice, the like 15 sided dice and roll them. And the first die would be the number of syllables per line. And then the second die would um, sort of give me a, a form for the number of lines per stanza or the number of stanzas. And um, so I tried to adhere really closely to that. Um, and at first it was sort of like a weird little gimmick I was doing to just give myself some order so that I could write. Um, and then over time I started to, especially because the, the single syllable um, kept coming up by by chance, I guess. Um, there was something about that that felt, um, I guess, appropriate to the kind of rhetoric and the, the ways in which I was hearing um, like political speech being used at the time where it was a lot of very sort of blunt, um, sometimes monosyllabic kind of language. And I thought, well, what can I do with that? How can I try to make, make something that feels um, important to me and, and um, I don't know, indicative of my experience of, of the world or of this country and still use that kind of like form that I was hearing being used a lot. And um, so that's where all those skinny single, single word lines came from. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even notice reading, um, but, but they're, not, they're not only one word per line, but they're all monosyllabic words um, on every yeah. line. Um, can you, is there some, do you do this often, um, that, that sort of, sort of artificial restraint? Um, I was just writing, we were talking a few weeks ago to, um, Paul E. Nelson, who has a book of American sentences, which is, um, mm. 17 syllables sentences. Um, and, and it has to be a, a, a discrete poem in 17 syllables in one sentence. And there's something about having a restraint that makes you be more creative, which is such a strange thing to think of that constraint makes creativity but 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 is that something you do often and, and how does that work for you yeah that's um that's almost almost exclusively how i write not not in that sort of dice rolling random way that was ex particular to that project but um pretty much every poem i write has some kind of constraint um and it's either uh, like a received form that i'm writing toward or most often i'll um set myself a uh syllabics, so some sort of syllable count that I'll use to kind of um, give myself a, like a loose framework to write into. Um, and for me, it helps because I, uh, my first draft is always just um, like a, a barf draft, if you will. <laughs> it's, it's just like getting it all out and it has no form whatsoever. Um, and then when I go back and revise, I, I start working with, you know, a, a sonnet or um a, a syllabic form or something to give it some shape and that really helps me hone the language and um get out all of remove all of the pieces that don't really need to be there it's only the things that feel i guess most essential at that point yeah yeah it's such an interesting process it's just so strange how the mind works you know how how you have to sort of i always feel like you have to turn off your consciousness in order to be creative i think that's and so everybody sort of has a trick 
you know, and it's different tricks. Like some people write in meter and rhyme. Some people like get into sort of, sort of a trance state as they're doing it. Um, and, and some people do it like with the revision process. It's just so fascinating to hear how poets do it. But it always seems like poets always have a way of um, turning off sort of the the too much willful will, as they say in, in mm-hmm. Zen and the Art of Archery. You know, that, that willful will that holds you back from, from surprising yourself, which is really the way that poetry functions, I think. Um, now you are in Portland, and Dan Knox asked something that I was wondering about, too. Um, have you gone downtown uh, to Portland to see the demonstrations? And, um, and, and what, is it, what is your sense of that? I have uh, um, several friends who live in Portland on Facebook and whatnot, and I get such mixed opinions about what's going on there right now. Um, you know, some people are, are think that it's you know, sort of all overblown um, in the media, and it's just like two blocks is what I hear all the time. And then um, some people think it's like the worst thing ever, and it's anarchy in the streets. And I don't know what to make of it. So, <laughs> so what do you what do you make of what's going on in Portland right now? Yeah, it's sort of um, uh, it's so I. I would say I have I have been to the demonstrations um, sometimes, and I usually go earlier in the evening um, before a lot of the police violence um, and like declarations of riots start to happen, um, just to for my own personal safety. Mm-hmm. Um, but my gauge of it is that. Uh, I th- I think the way I see it represented in the media is that Portland is like a disaster zone right now. And it's actually, I mean, I walk around Portland during the day feeling very safe, um, you know, comparable to the rest of my life. Um, and I think in the, the, the moments where it feels, um, scary and violent to me are the moments when, um, you know, I, I witness or hear from friends, the ways in which they've been protesting in very sort of, um, peaceful ways and, and are getting, you know, tear gassed by police mm-hmm. and um, having, you know, just having that experience of an excessive use of force or, um, you know, most recently this past weekend when we had um, kind of a, a far right rally um, that um, clashed with um, Black Lives Matter protesters and um, that experience of, um just you know somebody was was killed during that and it, it's it's a very strange experience to know that in the same place where things feel quite safe most of the time also mm-hmm. there's that capacity for um you know extreme violence yeah on a, any given night yeah yeah my sense of it has always been and i don't know if this is true or not but that that just um sort of violent people like there's certain certain violent people who you just use it use le- legitimate protests as an excuse and it's like cover um for for their proclivity to proclivity to be violent um and and i don't know if that's i don't know if that's true or not but um that's been my sense of it um so so like you have these big crowds during the day and then and then the the good people go home and then sort of some tiny people stay or something like that but i don't know yeah, I think there are lots of good people who are staying mm-hmm. to like well into the evenings who are um, like just protesting in very moving ways and, and in nonviolent ways. And um, but I think that, you know, there are a handful of people who um, I think are are seeking, you know, an outlet for their anger or their fear or whatever else might be happening with them and choose to act it out through violence and um it's disappointing to see. Yeah, but. yeah, because I remember like um, the just sort of it's sort of a, a, a um, expansion of, of what I felt during the. Um, I, I did a lot of protesting during the Iraq War, and um, mm. you know, and there was sort of that. There were like most people there were were feeling, you know, just in solidarity and, and working f- toward a better world. And then there's just little like provocateur types, like on both sides like like on our side too there'd be some and then there'd be some like counter protesters and there's just these little people that just all they want to do is fight like it's like a like they want it to be like an nfl football game or something you know and yeah. you just want to smash each other and it's just it's strange 
yeah um but but anyway do you want to read some more poems let's go back to the the book or, or other things if you if you'd like yeah um maybe uh I think because of some of what we've just been talking about, I'll read. Um, there's a couple of poems um, that have been published as broadsides through Broadsided Press. Mm -hmm. And these are not in the book. They're more recent. Um, and one of them is about um, violence. And both of them are in um, very, I would say, pretty constrained form. So um, the first one is, now is not the time to talk about gun control. After her honeymoon, Katie returns to work. She makes sure to back her truck into the lot so her Oregonian sticker is visible to us all. Keenan, the new hire, asks where to go in the event of an active shooter. These walls are all windows. In the team meeting, Katie does not cry when she tells us how, the night they arrived back in the States, her new husband was stupid just the once, blew away his right knee, cleaning a loaded gun. I'm lucky I was home, Katie says. No one asks about the safety if he checked the chamber after he dropped the magazine. Later, at our desks, winter sun glares across our screens, dares us to look outside. Keenan pulls the blinds. At least we would see them coming, he says. He taps the glass, lowers the shade on Katie's tailgate, just married, still soaked on the black paint. And that was now is not the time to talk about gun control. A beautiful, um, or well, I don't know if beautiful is the right word, an intense uh, painting there by um, the artist Kristen yeah. T. Woodward. Um, for everybody who's um, only listening, it's a... It's a person, you can see kind of their, I don't know, like their intestines or something, like a kind of a see-through person holding a gun pointing at you is the picture. A very abstract and, and interesting picture. Um, how, did, how did these broadsides come to be? They're, they're really, both of these are really cool. Or... Yeah, so Broadsided Press, um, they, they do phenomenal work. And they, um, for both of these, Often they'll um, ask for poems or sort of short bits of prose and they'll pair them with particular paintings or, or artworks. Um, and for both of these, they were doing um, sort of very thematic or um, sort of uh, portfolio kind of publications of broadsides. And so for that one, they were looking for people who were um, could respond to specific artwork and write um, something sort of inspired by it or related to it in some way. So they had, I think, six six different um, pieces of art. And um, that particular image just drew me in. And I probably wrote like five or six different poems in response to it. And they were all really different. And um, so I, I sent them in and they chose that one to pair with that image. Um, and then the other broadside was is much more recent. It's been within the last few months. They um, they did this really great thing that I was very appreciative of. Where um, pretty early in the pandemic, they provided prompts and said, and they were all of those um, the kinds of things like very extreme, elaborate constraints that were meant to get you out of your own head. And said, you know write something uh, based on these prompts and send it in to us. We'll choose a few and then we'll create prompts for artists and then we'll pair them up. Um, and so um, the, the other poem uh, sickness, they, uh, the prompt for that was the beautiful outlaw, which is in a lipo form where you um, exclude one letter of the alphabet and have to include all of the others in each stanza, um, which it was a lot harder than I imagined it would be, and um, but was it produced something that I never would have written otherwise. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think I read um, an interview. Maybe it was when you received a uh, fellowship with the or Oregonian Oregonian fellowship or something like that. But you were talking about how what you're writing about lately is um, gun issues, and you mentioned in this interview that um, you have a lot of experience with guns, and, 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 and can you explain a little bit about that and, and, and what's going on with um, 
the series of poems that you're doing? Yeah. So um, it, I had been trying to write about gun violence for, for many years and, and was writing poems about it um, in response to particularly like mass shootings and to experiences that I'd had at work where, um, you know, we would have trainings on what to do if there was an active shooter. And um, at a certain point, I realized I had these really personal experiences with guns that I had just sort of uh, blocked out that, um, you know, growing up, my my grandparents um, were hunters, uh, or my grandfather really was a hunter. And, um, and so there were guns, you know, in in a home that I spent a lot of time in and it, it was like just part of a sort of seasonal ritual that there would be guns around. Um, and as I got older, I had some other, um, uh, family members who had guns, um, perhaps in when they should not have. <laughs> um, and, um, then as an adult, um, my partner is a veteran and was in the Iraq war. And, um, so is, uh, like very steeped in the language of weaponry in a way that um, has kind of like rubbed off on me over time um, because it's it's part of uh, a culture that um, yeah that's just been carried into into our home now and so um, I've just been yeah been writing and thinking a lot about how how much gun culture is ingrained in my life, even though I've never owned a gun, have no desire to own a gun, um, find them kind of terrifying, um, but still know that they're a part of who I am by virtue of all of these relationships in my life. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting issue, I think. Um, you know, and similar to me, like my father owned a gun store when I was growing up. Oh wow! And, um, and then and then I was very like anti gun for a while. And then we moved to the rural area where it takes like the police like a half an hour to get here, and I kind of understand why some people might want them. <laughs> mm. So so it's a very mixed kind of subject for me. And I've always felt like you mentioned um, your partner um, was in the military, and I always felt like it was so tied to imperialism, like like the gun culture itself. Like there's a way that we sort of need to glorify gun culture in order to make people want to go in the army and um mm -hmm. and, and and that seems like just tied in together like all the video games the um call of duty and all that stuff that are all um if not funded but like supported by like the pentagon and stuff i mean and you know like the football games with the military flying by and i mean it's just such a part of our culture which is so tied up with militarism and um I don't know. It's it's such an such an interesting, complicated issue that I don't know if anybody has addressed as deeply as it like needs to be addressed or something. Um, so is that is that a book that you're you're working on, or do you have um, a whole a whole manuscript like in the in the process, or is it just stuff you happen to be doing? Yeah, it's um, it was it was something that I happened to be doing, and it's it's just recently, within the last couple of weeks, kind of turned over into a tipping point where. Um, I, it's turning into a book and I think the book is going to be called Beautiful Outlaw. So I'm writing all of these poems that use the beautiful outlaw form. And then I'm also writing about, um, writing more about gun culture in my own life and also kind of riffing on that, that, um, slogan, you know, if, if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns and, and sort of what that means, both, you know, thinking about my own life and the people who have owned guns who uh, maybe shouldn't have, and also the ones who, you know, hold them legally and um, were trying to use them in safe and, um, I guess, appropriate ways. And yeah, um, trying to just work through all of that. Um, so I think there's there's probably many more poems to write before that book is finished, but it's it's making its way. Yeah, it's just such a it's one of those topics that like is begging for poems. You know, like like poems find the the cracks and like the things that we think we know about and 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 mm -hmm. um and it i don't know it's just a it, we need more books about that i think do you you you've mentioned project books a lot is that something that you you always do you know this book is um based on all the trump words his kind of vocabulary um are there is is that and in your other books have similar sort of themes i think is that how you go about poetry um like do you 
like how how does that work? I'm 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 just curious about that yeah. just in general. Yeah. So I would say again is the only one that feels like totally like a project book to me where I was like, oh, it started as a project, it kind of ended as a project. Mm -hmm. um, the other books, um, and, and I would say even this new one that I'm working on now too, they're all, um, I just wrote like a mishmash of whatever came out for a couple of years. And then I would start to see um, kind of a coalescing around, oh, like I'm a apparently obsessed with this. Um, and so I'm just going to lean really hard into that and, and keep doing that. And so like the first book was a lot about, um, you know, the thinking about the ways in which, um, like we're embodied and, um, thinking about sexuality and gender and desire in the context of the body. And that was something that I'd written a bunch of poems about other things, but after a while I was like, Oh, there's a lot of poems here about this. Maybe that's going to be a book. And um, kind of similar things happened with the other books where I would start to write and see like, oh, there's a lot of religious imagery here. Maybe I should just lean into that. And um, so that's, that's just happening again. Yeah, I heard someone say on this in this Rattlecast at some point that every book is an obsession. And I like that quote a mm -hmm. lot. Um, and, you know, it's just something that you might not even know that you're obsessed with. And then you realize when the, they keep coming up in poems that, that you're obsessed with it. Um, do you want to read um, the, the Sickness, the other broadside? Yeah. Sickness. We never married, thought it too quaint, too ball and chain, fixed, pinned. We rejected being yoked like oxen, caged together in that hallowed zoo. And yet, we dreamt of a honeymoon, Every place we'd explore were money no object. North and south of the equator, shore to shore, dozens of state parks. For now, you go as far as your job at the hospital, despite my qualms, for the hazard pay. Home at night, you wear a mask. I wear gloves. This is our latex without sex. This is love in a time when every blush conjures fever, when we quiz each other after each cough. I examine your hands, count as you soap them before we touch. For better or worse, we cozy together to wait for the latest dispatch. I exhaust myself with updates, jerk awake hours later. You've covered me with a quilt from your glory box. I find you gazing out a dark window, watching your ghost in glass vanish at civil dawn. I join you, squint to catch that phantom us, wearing a gown, a tux. No father gave you away, no mother arranged my veil, no frenzied crowd jockeyed for the bouquet. The rice, unthrown, we keep in the cupboard. We keep our extravaganza a private joy. We keep each quiet vow in the mouth to have and hold for richer and poorer now and in health. And that's another uh, broadside from Broadside Press that was um, paired with artist Michelle um I don't know how to say this. La Horo? Would you say that? Or La I think it's La Ro. La Ro? I think. Okay, let me let me show on screen so you can at least see how it might be pronounced. It's down here. Artist Michelle La Ho I have no idea. Um but but a interesting artwork and um really cool poem. Um and that was from Broadside Press, um Sickness by Jennifer Perrine. Um, I forgot to say, remind people that they can ask you questions. Um, so I'll just have to ask you a last question. Um, but one thing I was wondering is just, you, you mentioned earlier um, uh, all the poets that you learned from. You were talking about um, how you got into writing poetry. Is there any piece of advice that you feel like is a touchstone or something that you, like one nugget of wisdom that um, was passed along to you that you've, that you've taken advantage of now? Oh my goodness. Um, I'll share this one because it's the first one that came to mind. And at the time it was, um, 
Oh, it was so hard to receive it. Um, so when I was in grad school, probably about a year or so in, I had the really fortunate opportunity to study with Sonia Sanchez uh, for a semester. And um, she she taught a course where uh, she asked us to write exclusively in re- received forms all semester, um, which obviously changed my, my life. Um, but sh- during the course, towards the end of it, uh, we were in a private meeting and she said, she quoted um, a poem, I believe it's by Louise Bogan, about um, uh, not having any wildness in you. And she said, your poems have no wildness in them. And it broke my heart and I'm pretty sure I cried. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, but it's something that over time I really took to heart and thought about um, the ways in which, even though I love form, um, that sometimes it can be used, or poetry in general can be used to be kind of clever or um, to be all kind of up in your head and intellectual. Um, and so I've tried to take that advice and think, how can I make make poems uh, feel the wildness that life feels like all the time? Because life feels pretty wild, even outside of all the stuff that's been happening recently, um, and try to get that into the poems. And um, so I don't know how that translates into advice for other folks, but um, if there's something that feels wild to you, trying to get that um, into the poem somehow, I think it it makes a difference for me. Oh, that is such a great answer, because I I was thinking, you know, the the leaps from the, the words in this book into what you go into it is a wildness. So that's that's really cool to wow. hear you say that. Um, I think that's great advice. Do you want to finish off with one last poem from the book? Sure. Um, go with this one. A lot of poems feel pretty bleak, and I think this one is a more hopeful one. It's Tough, which is on page 23. Tough as nails driven not to join but to hook, as old boots that still march after poundings they took on harsh streets, as cheap cuts of meat and jaw muscles that flex to tear and grind, as tanned hide stretched into a drum and mallet swung in steady time, as thick tissue formed over wounds, as our armor, no ardor may pass through, as spires that rise like teeth and drip with spit in the dark caves we fumble blind, as the brittle shell that signals the ripeness of the seed inside. Excellent. That was tough from um, Jennifer Perrine's new book that just released today again, uh, thanks so much for joining us, Jennifer. It's just wonderful hearing these poems and, and your insights into things. Thanks so much for being on the Rattlecast. Thank you. It was wonderful to be here. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Hope you have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. So that was Jennifer Perrine with her um, newest book again, which I'll flash on the screen really quick one last time. Um, this beautiful cover from um, Airly Press. You can find it at airlypress.org. That's A. I-R-L-I-E press.org um, pick it up for 16 bucks and um, that is again by Jennifer Perrine and you can find Jennifer Perrine of course at jenniferperrine.org that's Jennifer like you'd think to spell it plus P-E-R-R-I-N-E jenniferperrine.org um, excellent book as always and a really fun conversation so glad Jennifer could join us tonight um now we're going to move on to the open mic section of the evening, and um, the where yeah the um, prompt for this week was let me give it to Jennifer really quick and then put up the um, numbers on screen. Um, if you haven't yet, you can email your poem to openmic at rattle dot com so I can show it on screen. Um, and then the phone number is 818-850-7727. Let it ring a few times. I will call you back when the time is right. Um, if you'd prefer Skype, which is what we'd prefer, because then we can see it too, um, just send a chat message to me at Rattle Poetry, all one word, and I'll call you back when the time is right. And um, we have a bunch of people lined up who would like to share poems, and 
Uh, we have a whole bunch tonight. Wow, we have a lot. Um, hopefully we can get to everybody. Hopefully everybody's here too. Um, now Megan, um, as you know, does these prompts and she always writes them in the morning with her coffee um, um, on Tuesday morning and she wasn't feeling well, I'm sorry to say, so did not write a poem this week. Uh, that's okay. I didn't write a poem last week. Um, I have two poems for you though. So, um, so my poem, um, from the prompt that I wrote this week, um, I decided to write it about, um, the ninth wave, which is this, um, painting by, up here we go, by Ivan Ivyatsky. Did I say that? Did I write that right? Or is it A-I-V? I might have typoed that. Um, but it's a Russian painter. And this is The Ninth Wave by Ivan Aviatsky. I think it's Aviatsky. I think I wrote it wrong. Um, let's see. We'll look at the poem and see how it looked. No, I guess I, maybe I did write it right. So this is The Ninth Wave based on that poem. The Ninth Wave. In this world of waves, there comes the ninth. Cold shock of its turning. The ship that would have sailed you home as an island of splinters. The snapped pencil of the mast has no eraser. And so you cling. Clouds part into light. All you can do is sing. That was my poem for today, The Ninth Wave, based on this painting by Ivan Aviasky. Aviazovsky. Um, it's a beautiful painting. I'd never seen this before. Um, sort of a, and, and The Ninth Wave was um, in sailor's lingo. Um, was they, they would say that the, there would eight, be eight waves that were sort of normal size, and then the ninth wave would be huge and catastrophic. And um, so that's what that poem was about. And then I thought I would share, since Megan didn't have one, and I never read poems from my book, um, I have a poem in here in um, American Fractal, which is my book from Red Hen Press a while ago. Um, there, there it is, American Fractal. Um, I have a poem in here about... Nighthawks by Edward Hopper, which is also on this page. So I thought that I would um, have this as a fallback um, in case I didn't manage to write one. and um, But then I did. So um, I got to find it, though. Um, so then when Megan didn't have a poem, I thought I'd just read two because I'm uh, selfish like that. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, page 53 of my old book. This is... Uh, after Hopper, and it's based on this um, um, painting Nighthawks, of course, one of the most famous paintings in the world by Edward Hopper. And um, the story behind this is that when I was at USC, I used to always go, um, I, I worked at Rattle while I was getting my MFA, and um, I, so I only go on campus once a week, and every week I would go to the stacks there at the library at USC and just grab some books at random. And one day I found a book with, um, there was an anthology of nothing but Edward Hopper paintings or poems written after Edward Hopper paintings. And my professor at the time was Robert Mezzi, who um, unfortunately passed away. Um, I'm not sure if it was from COVID or just from, from old age, um, but he died pretty recently in the last couple of months. Um, but he had a poem in there. So I thought I would kind of, um, and he also, the other thing I should mention is that he, um, um, it didn't like when I used um, slant rhyme. Um, which was something I was doing a lot at the time. And um, so I wrote this poem kind of for him, even though it doesn't say for um, for Robert Mezzi, but but this was for him. This is um, a poem for my book, American Fractal. And here's, this is After Hopper. She says that everything is after Hopper. That posh hotel, you looked about to slap her, but never did. Sometimes she'd wait at night in her blue robe, face folded like the note you didn't leave crumpled in a coat pocket. Sometimes she'd stand in broad daylight, naked before an open window, flesh so pale and round and full it seemed about to pull a tide of ruddish men up from the street. But mostly it's the red dress, the cut straight, sleeveless, loose, and her mouth is only lipstick. She says you never even see her talk, but just about to talk, about to smile. She says that every moment is a jail. This diner is her prison of endless light, the ceaseless hour always getting late, yet no one moves. Her cigarette remains unlit. The busboy doesn't lift his hands. 
You could write a thousand lines, she says, on all the things she never does or has. How she seems so sad she might have cried. How you only see her almost satisfied. So that is my poem after Hopper from American Fractal. I took, um, it's uh, after Nighthawks, but I, I, I took a bunch from a bunch of different Edward Hopper paintings for that poem. Um, so hope you enjoyed those too. Um, let's see what you have up. Um, who do we have? Um, now we got poems from a whole bunch of people. We have, um, uh, Michelle Parks, Jessica Dawson, Sally Dunn, Richard Westheimer, Angela Gartner, The Usual Crowd, um, Joyce Stahl, um, Jennifer Perrine. We have, oh, I, I talked to Jennifer Perrine already. We have a 978 number. We have Caitlin. We got a 209 number. So let's go to the first person to uh, message me right at 6 o'clock on the dot, and that was Angela Gartner. Let's call up Angela. Let me find her poem on here. Ooh. Angela Gar. <laughs> hey, Angela, how you doing tonight? Good. I, I was like, quick. I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always a, a big shock. Let me pull you in. Um, oops, hang on. There you are. Um, so, how you doing tonight? And what what poem did you or what painting did you write about? Um, I wrote about um, Vince Van Gogh's uh, The Night Cafe, and he actually did it in September 1888. And it was, um, he, he actually, why he, I mean, he painted it, he was thinking about painting it, but he was kind of like mad at the cafe owner. Cause he like took like, like he had like, he's like all this money. He was about like the money. He was like, he was like, you know, taking all this money from him. And so he's like, he actually, after he painted it, he, um, gave it to the owner as payment for his room. Oh, wow. I didn't and, know that. Yeah. I mean, this is according to, um, you know, the media, the, some of the things that I found on it. And, um, but he, he also called it one of the ugliest <laughs> pictures he's done. And oh, wow. to his brother Theo, because he wrote a lot to his brother Theo. But, you know, The Starry Night's one of my favorites, but I just... You know, I kind of was drawn to this when I saw it, and especially like Happy September. You know, I thought this would be cool, and and it was really about a room about like these low life, these 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 people that would come in. It was kind of the last stitch. It was the last place that they would come. You know, they were just down and out on their luck, and you know, um, and that kind of you can see that from the painting. But I named it Blood Red because that's the description he wrote to Theo because he wrote, you know like the description of what work he was doing. And he was just like the, the walls are blood red. So, um, it, 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 I, I, you know, I, it was, it, it's a nice prompt because, you know, you just kind of get to, it's, you know, Vanko was a painter, you know, we know, and, you know, but it's, it's kind of, you get to go in depth with some of his other works too, that you don't really get time to do, you know, in your adult life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I loved, I have to say, I loved um, the link that Megan included. Um, because I, I love reading about all these paintings that, that probably a third of which I'd seen, but but two thirds I hadn't. And um, learning about the painters a little bit and a little blurb, it was really fun. Um, and I love Van Gogh. I've always thought that Van Gogh is sort of the, his paintings are sort of the epitome of what poetry should be doing, which is sort of like giving some real life, but then like making it even livelier than real life or something like that. Um, so, so let's hear, this is um, Blood Red and it's ready for everybody. I agree. The drunk, dragging his leg behind him, almost falls down. He orders everyone around while coughing up green bile. Patrons slap their knees at the scene and laugh at the clown. His watery, half-closed eye stares at them and he smiles. A bottle rolls underneath him on the floor. He smashes it into pieces to please his crowd, but they are not looking at him anymore. He let out a threatening roar and made a vow. I will not drink again. It was my last pint, he boasts. Before I go, I raise my hand and will do a toast to my wife who left me and didn't leave a note. For tomorrow, if you see me, I will be a ghost. Awesome. That was Blood Red by Angela Gardner. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Excellent poem. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you too. Okay, um, 
Let's see. Next up will be. Um, let's see. Richard Westheimer. Let's call up Richard. Find his poem now. Ah, uh, here it is. The phone is ringing. Hey, Richard, how you doing? Let me let me pull you in. Hey, yeah. Hello. How you doing tonight? Good. I got my camera to work. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. You were small and now you're big, so I got to shrink you again. Let's see. Okay. Boop. There you go. So, um, what did you write about tonight? Oh, I picked an odd one, uh, Massacre of the Innocents by Peter Paul Rubens. Oh, excellent. Um, and it just, uh, it struck me. It just struck me. I actually had seen some of the pen and ink sketches that he did in prep preparation for that when we were in Vienna a few years oh, ago. Wow. And uh, so I was immediately attracted to it and um, got a little wild. But a little, <laughs> little, little, little awesome. Um, uh, I won't read the um, the epigraphs here, but basically, the Massacre of the Innocents is a um, taken from a little snippet of a line in Matthew where Herod um, orders the um, theoretically orders the murder of all the um, male children under the age of two, and the painting depicts that. Yeah, that's such an amazing yeah. scene in this painting. I remember it from. I don't think I I remember from the list, but I remember um, from the past. Yeah. Yeah, well, do you want to go ahead and, and read it? Uh, sure. Um, a love song for the massacre of the internet, of the innocents, after the painting by Peter Paul Rubens. What if all those slaughtered boys were baby Hitlers? When torn from their mother's arms, the tears would have been for joy that their children's broken bodies dashed against the stones were saving the future from a hundred tiny holocausts. And maybe Pharaoh, too, we judged too soon, his thwarted decree to drown those newborn Hebrews. Maybe he knew one might spawn the man who split the atom, or another would seed the revolt of the masses. And if I'd been taken from my cradle, tossed in the air like my daddy did me, then cast yowling to the ground by some savior, shattered, shorn of my life. My mother's cries would have been heard by those who knew I would not grow to become the tipping point, the one whose excess drove the raging wildfires and superstorms of the apocalypse. Wow, that is a powerful poem. And yeah, a little dark. Thanks for sharing that, Richard. Excellent. Thanks yeah. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Uh, yeah, that's a great painting and a great poem. Um, let's see. Who is next in line? Um, let's do Jessica Dawson next. She wasn't technically next, but she's always last. So let's not let's do her non last for once. And I'll pull up her poem as it's ringing. Oh, based on the scream. Hello. Hey, Jessica, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, another fun episode. Love love hearing from uh, Jennifer Perrine. Um, so what painting did you, oh, you did the scream. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing you want to know what is, um, I, I always thought that the scream, like I'm, I'm going to be embarrassed myself a little bit. I always thought that was Van Gogh too. I didn't realize that it was, um, Edward Munch and not Van Gogh. Um, so apparently I am extremely ignorant. <laughs> um, then you're not going to love this part. Um, so you pronounce his name Munch. Okay, well, I am doubly, <laughs> or maybe triply, I'm a, a triumvirate hey, ignorant no, let ignoramus. me spare you. I thought this was Van Gogh, too. So, like, when I was looking, I was like, that's a lie. Like, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I thought. And you know what? I think that um, so similar. this is the, the Mandela same. effect. And we used to, you and I lived in a universe where um, <laughs> Van Gogh made the screen. <laughs> 
and um, and now we switch universes where where Trump is president and um, Edward Edward Munch wrote the scream. <laughs> Uh, that's the only time. explanation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, the screen um, is on screen. If everybody knows this painting, it's probably. I think this is might maybe the most famous painting. Um, I don't know how anything could be more famous than the screen. Um, it, it's super recognizable, and I think too, it's uh, relatable. Like I don't know. Like for me personally, when I look at this, I'm like, I'm this person. Like this is how <laughs> I feel a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is like the the end of the modern world or something, or the or the modern end of the world. I guess I should. Yes, that that is, that's actually like, exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is too too much is happening. We need to to just be like farming and hoping for rain or something is how we were evolved to be. But um, anyway, <laughs> so um, so what was your poem? This was um, if you can see them too, uh, it's on screen whenever you are ready. Okay. Um, I'll preface this by saying, uh, cause I feel like sometimes you have to, to certain people, um, this is not about me. It is not a true story. <laughs> there we go. I got that out of the way. <laughs> that's, that's always good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. If you can see them too, tell me my mind has been an ink blot since elementary unfolding nightly shapes in the scratch stains of my bedroom door where shadow figures stand silently, splintering my reality. The first time I screamed, they faded like the fog I remember trying to get lost in as a child. Every time someone found me. I let them stow me on the front pews so cross-laden men with serpent tongues could break the blaming circles of speeches my parents walked in. I grew quiet in the surrender of their love learning to stare back in silence at each new figure that appeared around me. If all they do is stare, we can be alone together. Oh, great last line. If all they do is stare, we can be alone together. That is creepy. And that is creepy <laughs> enough to, to, to symbolize this painting. Um, thanks so much for sharing that, Jessica. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Have a yeah. great night. Good night. You too. Let's see. Um, next up would be... Um, Sally Dunn. Try to find Sally's poem while it's ringing. There we go. Hey, Sally, how you doing? Doing okay. I think I hear myself in the background. Oh wait, no, I don't. You're good. Let me um before you do. You want to say what your your um uh, poem is about? Uh, yeah, I I uh, cheated a little. I uh, I looked at all the painting, you know, paintings on on the list, and I, you know, I saw a few that I could uh, write about. But I, every, you know, the more paintings I looked at, the more I kept thinking of this uh, uh, photograph I uh, knew of uh, one of Rodin's uh, sculptings, mm -hmm. and uh, so I ended up writing about his. Um, Rodin sculpting the she who was once the helmet maker's beautiful wife. Excellent. Yeah, I'll put it on the screen for you. I googled it really quick. This is the the painting that you're writing or the sculpture that you're writing about. Rodin is probably my favorite. I mean, the the emotion um, is just amazing in these sculptures that he does. Um, so, so here yeah, he's the, amazing. He, yeah, really, seriously. I'm um, so here. This is she once was beautiful. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, she who was once beautiful. I grew up with her. She was always beautiful. The way only extreme ugliness can be beautiful. I'd thumb through my father's old book of Rodin's sculptings, and always I'd come to her and stare and stare and stare. I wanted to reach into her chest, pull out her heart, examine it, and thereby understand how she came by such exquisite ugliness. She has a story in her knotted finger bones, a story in her deflated breasts, her sagging belly and stick legs. I want to grab her face, look into her eyes, and force her to tell me the truth of me. Oh, excellent poem. That was Sally Dunn. With she once was beautiful based on this uh, Rodin painting. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that, Sally. Thank you. Yeah, good night. Good night. 
Let's see. Who do we have next? We have a lot of people. I don't know if we're going to get to everybody. Um, I'm sorry to say. Um, um, let's see. Three. Let's do Michelle Parks. Hey. Hey, Michelle. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Let me um. I gotta try to find your your way. Let's see. Am I? Am I? There you go. <laughs> let me yeah. see. Um. Let me let me put Sometimes your. Sometimes um... I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're using your phone. I think most people are on the computer, so it's a different like like angle or or not angle like um perspective. You're in portrait, so I have to adjust. Uh, let me get your poem uh -huh. into a Word doc so I don't give everybody your email address by accident. Okay, so <laughs> so your poem is called Fuck Mona, which I imagine is about the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Um, and I don't even think I have to Google yeah. and find the Mona Lisa. I think everybody knows. I think on our list that we um, included, this was the top poem. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah. is there anything you want to say before you read it? Yeah, because for me... It was visceral when you said the prompt. Mm -hmm. Like I immediately flashed on her and became a five-year-old again. And luckily, I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I changed the name of the plane to put Mona Lisa. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let me put it up so, for everybody. Um, there we go. Fuck Mona Lisa. <laughs> and yeah. um, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Mustering up courage, my five-year-old self ran past those ten feet monitored by Mona. Don't pee on the carpet between sunroom and parlor. My grandmother yodeled for her flattened scrubs. She was also a sadist. Mona Lisa was her smile, dark and lingering, waiting for me to fuck up again so I could be taught properly how to be a lady. Mona Lisa smiles, no food in the parlor. Grandma's words strike before she enters the room with Mona's approval. Mona always approves, so I'll be a good Christian girl. When we came to her house after church, I was punished for not singing hymns. I had to stand beneath Mona, always beneath Mona. When I first did coke, I thought of Mona. I thought of Mona. When I had my first son, my grandma called him Buster. When I got my shit together, I stopped calling grandma. When my grandmother died, I started a bonfire. By fucking Mona. My smile was better anyway. Wow. Yeah. Excellent poem. That was yeah. <laughs> Mona Lisa by um, Michelle Parks. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah. That was great. Okay, yeah, have a good night. Thank you. Okay, um, who is next? Let's see. Did Richard. Let's go to... Let's do Joyce Stahl. We haven't done talked to Joyce Stahl in a while. I'll try to find Joy's poem. Here we go. Traveler. Based on this painting. Oh, yeah, that was a cool one. Okay. Hello. Hey, Joy. How are you doing tonight? All right. Um, and you have a poem um, based on um, Henry Rousseau's The Sleeping Gypsy, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, is there anything you want to say before you read it? Let me let me put it on screen for everybody really quick. This is the Sleeping Gypsy. Um, that was another painting that I wasn't familiar with, but thought was so cool. I love that. Yeah, I actually didn't remember ever seeing it before. And when I scrolled through the list of poems or of pictures that really jumped out at me, and so because I teach middle school. I made this a prompt for their journal entries today. They had to respond to the painting and they said, Oh, you're going to steal our ideas. <laughs> uh, but actually I didn't get to start grading them until I started watching the Rattlecast. So I've been <laughs> multitasking here. That's great. So a bunch of kids wrote poems about paintings too. Is that what you mean? Uh, not poems. I just made the, I just told them write something about what the, you see in the image or uh, write a story or, uh, I also told them to pretend to be news reporters, but nobody took me up on that. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. That's excellent. Um, so is this over Zoom? Do you have to do it? 
Uh, no, we're we're in person. Oh, you're in person. Where are you doing in person? Uh, in very very rural Kansas. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, this is the Traveler. So go ahead whenever you're ready. I have it on screen. Um, there. Go ahead. Okay. The desert oasis sings a lullaby, irresistible to a weary traveler. How longed for is sleep. How precious fresh water. How welcome unexpected company. Oh, nice. I love that. How welcome unexpected company. Thanks so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Yeah, and uh, once again, that was um, Joy Stahl with uh, Traveler based on this poem. Let me put it up on screen one last time. This was um, um, The Sleeping Gypsy, 1897, by Henry Rousseau. Thanks so much uh, for calling. All right. Good night. Okay, um, who is next? Let's see, it's 7.30. I got to get the kids to bed soon. We got Caitlin... We got Kathy Gibbons. We got Diane Knox. Um, we got a nine eight. Let's do the nine seven eight number because I don't know who that is. We'll see who that is. This might be Joseph Nolan. That's my guess. Let's see. Nine seven eight. No idea where that is. West Coast somewhere. Hello. Hey, uh, this is Tim with Reddit. Do you want to share a poem? Yes, this is Brenda Kamarinsky calling. Ah, oh, cool. Let me. Oh, there, Brenda Kamarinsky. Let me put you on. Um, well, I'll do that later. Um, so, what what um, painting did you do? So, everyone knows it as Whistler's Mother. I have to. I had to do Whistler's Mother. I live in Billerica, Mass, which is right next door to Lowell, Mass, which is the birthplace of James Whistler. Oh, cool. So, local boy did good. <laughs> so everyone knows this painting as Whistler's Mother, but that's not the name of it. Oh, it's really? Arrangement in Gray and Black, number one. Hmm. And when he first showed this painting in London, all the Londoners were very upset because it's a portrait. It's a portrait of your mother. She's not just part of an arrangement. <laughs> and it upset their, their sensibilities that he was downgrading his mother to just being part of an arrangement. So... Hmm. I tried to honor his uh, original intent that it's an arrangement, not a portrait, and look at the painting as an arrangement. That's interesting. I never knew that. Um, so this yeah. is Regarding an Arrangement in Gray, Black, Number 1 by James Whistler. Let's hear it. Yes. My eye is drawn first to the face, as any human eye would be, then to the gray wall behind her, and I do understand that truth next to the drape with its details, and finally, resting on the painting within, its stark black frame and bright white mat. What is the origin story for this landscape? Whistler sat his mother under it. She dressed in black and gained fame, but the print did not. Interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating, given the backstory. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, I learned something yeah. today. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Have yeah. a good night. You too. Yes, that was Brenda Kamarinsky. Let me, um, give me one second. Let me add her as a contact so that we know who she is next time. Um, Brenda Kamarinsky. Okay. Um, let's see. Who is next? We got a bunch. Um, let's see. We did. Let's do Diane Knox. Try to find Diane's poem. Hey, Diane, it's Tim with Rattle. Did you want to share your poem? I do. Awesome. And what did you write it about? I wrote it about uh, number 68, Renee mm -hmm. Magritte's The Treachery of Images. Okay, let me try and, to find it. Magritte. Uh, uh, si ce n'est pas un pipe. This is, is not a pipe. Oh, it says this is on the pipe one. Okay. Um, let me just type that in. I think everyone's probably familiar with that painting, but this, this is not a pipe. Okay. Here we go. Oop, hang on. Okay. Um, just one second. Image address. Okay. I'll put it on screen for everybody. I think everybody knows this painting. This is one of the most famous. I, I love this too. This is not a pipe. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. So is there anything you want to say or do you just want to dive right in? Uh, I, just that mine is a typewritten page that looks like a poem, <laughs> but I write that it is not. Interesting. Anyway. Okay, yeah, let, let's hear it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is not a poem, and, and I am not a poet, you know yet. <laughs> this is not a poem, rather words on paper. No rhythm, no rhyme, no once upon a time. Not about feelings and dreams, or an artist planting seeds. Not pretending to know life, or expounding on strife. Love and beauty are not part of this, unless you see beyond bliss. Emotion is not involved, has taken a turn, evolved. I want to change your view. I don't want to change your mind. Like cataracts on your eyes are not shades coming down on time. This is not a poem with pretty sentences. No sentimental defenselessness. This is a jackhammer pounding your core, not flowery verse helping you restore. Simplicity is the answer we seek. A pipe that is a pipe without question. A poem is a poem by suggestion. Oh, that was excellent. I love that. This is not a poem, and I am not a poet by Diane Knox based on <laughs> um, This is Not a Pipe. This is, I think this is my favorite um, prompt we've done yet. This is a lot of fun looking at these paintings and seeing everybody's interpretations. Uh, thanks so much, Diane. That was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Who have we not done yet? Um, we have Kathy Gibbons. Let's see. I'm um, Caitlin, too. Let's do... Um, Let's do Caitlin and then Kathy. Then we have a 209, um, and I think that's it. So let's just do everybody. Um, I'll stay up a little late. The kids will, you know, they're playing a video game probably. They like it. They can stay up a little late. Um, let's do um, let's do Caitlin and Kathy, then the 209, and we'll finish out that way. So it's ringing now. I don't know. Caitlin Buxbaum. Hey, Caitlin, how are you doing tonight? Hi. Let me pull you in. Oop. Let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah, you have a huge bandwidth. My giant today. Yeah, what is your, <laughs> who is your internet provider so that everybody can um, be on the same internet provider as you? Because. Well, they can't because it's an Alaskan company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have the same thing. We have, um, in our little small town, we had terrible internet service, which is why I didn't do these years ago because I couldn't. And um, then some local person who owns an internet company said, hey, I own an internet company. Let's wire the town. And so now we have one gig oh fiber. Gosh, that's funny. Yeah. So, so we're streaming at one that's gig. Awesome. But before I had this, um, I had, um, it was like AT&T. And if a squirrel would like run across the wire somewhere, it would be like drop. <laughs> so there was no way we were doing, oh, man. doing shows until they did that. So let's see. So you did, um, who is this? This is... Yeah, what's the whose painting oh, is this? Shoot, I already. Oh, Mie is how you pronounce. He's a French artist. Uh, is Jean Francois, I think. Uh -huh. like, yeah, I'll put um, it on the screen. This is this is your the one you're writing about. Um, there you go. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I actually wasn't. Most of the ones on the on the list I looked at, I was not super familiar with. A lot of them I had never seen before. But it's funny because I. A friend of mine, I shared this poem with a friend of mine, and, and she said, oh, I love that painting, and there's this documentary that references it, and hmm. I was, yeah, so, um, but, I, and I was also experimenting with a new French form I hadn't tried. Oh, what is it? Um, I think, since it's French, it's probably pronounced bref double. Interesting. But looks like double, mm -hmm. and I think it just means brief double, which is kind of a weird name for it, but, um... It's a pretty tight kind of rhyme scheme, you know. There's, um, I think, oh, well, now I don't even remember because I wrote this a few <laughs> days ago. But um, the, it's it's rhyming and not rhyming. So the second and fourth line of each quatrain are not supposed to rhyme, which is was actually kind of hard for me to do. Hmm, interesting. Um, but there, I think there's some 
Yeah. Anyway, well, I'm I'm tired. I'm just going to read the poem. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. It's on screen. Yep. And it's called The Gleaners. What can three women leaning over small seeds they have sown hear from dirt's persistent birth that a straighter back would miss? If ever they could relax and out of rest find meaning, would they teach us how to pray for mercy and forgiveness? I doubt any wiser words have been spoken by a man in his world domination than what's left these women's lips. Gems gathered from the gleaning and the tending of the earth. Excellent. And that was uh, The Gleaners by Caitlin Buxbaum and uh, based on this painting by, can you say it again? Who is it by? <laughs> I think you say his name, uh, Jean-Francois Millet. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Another excellent poem. These are so fun. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks for the prompt. It was a good yeah, one. Yeah, it was. Good night. See ya. Okay, let's see. And then we have, after Caitlin was going to be um, Kathy Gibbons. And then we have 209 after that. Good evening. Hey, Kathy. How are you doing tonight? Hi, Tim. I'm doing great. Thank you. This is such a fun prompt. I've been loving every moment, and Jennifer as well, of course. Yeah, Thanks. you're a little quiet. Is there a way you can get closer to the phone? Um, is that any better? That's a little better, yeah. Okay, so what okay. did you what did you write about? I wrote about a painting by Picasso, Don Quixote, and it's kind of a meditation on ownership of a painting and co-owners of a painting and um i thought of thoughts about marriage and relationships and um and anyway <laughs> very interesting yeah so we have it here let me i'll put it on screen for everybody it's a very small yeah. this is a like a, a sketchy kind of painting is that right i think it started as a drawing and then i read that it, he did do it in an oil i believe for him hmm. and um and the thought is that sometimes when we embark upon a long-term relationship or marriage and when we start our journeys we find that um the person whom we're journeying with um may share a few tangible things with us as well as the intangible and such as in this poem it would be a painting and a couple of record albums mm -hmm. anyway. very interesting okay well go ahead no tightrope but a trampoline by uh, kathy gibbons go ahead Oh, yeah, and I apologize. I think I've mixed one too many metaphors in here as well. <laughs> that's okay. That's so fun. Anyway. Okay. No tightrope, but a trampoline. When first we met, we both had that Picasso print of Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, faithful by his side, floating overhead, our dreams. Now here we lie, 400 years or more have passed, dreams dashed and or surpassed, black and white, Thick figures we are not. Trudge along, tilt at windmills till they're gone. We both had Joni Mitchell's album Blue, too, and Rubber Souls to bounce more freely through the world. Excellent. That was Kathy Gibbons. That was such an interesting little sketch. I, I'm going to go find the, um, you said this is a sketch for a bigger painting. Uh, I'm going to go find that now. Yeah. 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 yeah Very cool. So no tightrope but a trampoline. Thanks for sharing that, Kathy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for tonight. It was wonderful. Yeah, my Bye. pleasure. I'm just having so much fun. Let's see. Um, you know, I'm looking at the internet, and um, it looks like everybody just has a sketch. Which is, I heard Picasso averaged more than um, a painting a day, or a piece of art a day. Like, he averaged in his lifetime more than one thing per day, which is just amazing. Like, talk about the Pareto distribution or whatever. Um, yeah, all I see here is the, um, the sketch that Kathy had. So that's fascinating. Okay. Anyway, let's call up our last guest and this will be, make sure I have everybody. We got Jennifer. Okay. So this is a 209 number. I don't know who this is. We'll find out in a second. Phone is ringing. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, did you want to share your poem? Sure. 
Awesome. It's called In and, Love with Whistler's Mother. Awesome. And who am I talking to, first of all? This is Joseph Nolan. Ah, hey, Joseph. And where, where are you calling from? Stockton, California. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Let me put this in a uh, Word doc really quick. Um, and so you wrote about the same painting as um, someone else did already. Um, yes, like two or three callers back. Yeah, let me show it on screen one more time. Yeah, this is uh, Whistler's mother. Um, and uh, there you go. And uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm in love with Whistler's mother, sitting still in her chair, steadfast as Gibraltar, her eyes an iceberg stare. Off in the corner, a biscuit, on table, a hot cup of tea. Nearby, a scone makes you feel right at home where no one will bother thee. Some men prefer Mona Lisa. Her smile, they say, takes their hearts. For me, though, it's Whistler's mother, like granite, never to part. Excellent. That was Joseph W. Nolan with In Love with Whistler's Mother. Thanks so much. Uh, just, I love the reading, Thanks, too. That Jim. reminds me of um, listening to um, older posts. Like if you ever listen to T.S. Eliot, the, the emphasis on, on the sounds. Great reading style. Thanks, Joe. Oh, thanks, Tim. See you later. Yeah, good night. Okay, let me um, let me add Joseph Nolan as a contact so we know who that is next time we call him up. And um, let me double check to to see uh, make sure we got everybody tonight who wanted to share their poem. Um, I hate to leave anybody out. Um, let's see. I'm just looking. Sorry, sorry. This is great, great, entertaining. Uh, podcasting. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have everybody. So that is the show for tonight. Thanks everybody for uh, joining me. It's been a pleasure as always. I love this prompt. Um, before I forget the prompt for next week is going to be right here. That's not right. Right here. That is look out your window, write a poem about what you see. That's next week's prompt for the, um, September 8th Rattlecast, and that is look out your window, write a poem about what you see, and if you've been uh, if you've been listening to the Rattlecast regularly, you know what I'm going to be writing about, um, but I'll leave it a secret, because there's only one thing outside of my tree, but it's a fun thing, uh, so um, I know what I'm writing about already. That was uh, this week's prompt, for ne or next week's prompt, look out your window, Write a poem about what you see. Now, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be Alejandro Escudé. Uh, that's a Rattlecast number 57, uh, Tuesday, September 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. His most recent book is The Book of the Unclaimed Dead. I interviewed him for um, the Immigrant Poets issue. Uh, he was born in Argentina. Um, that was Rattle number 53, maybe. Um, and he's been in Poetry Spawn so many times. We published him a whole bunch. He used to be a newspaper reporter. Now he's a school teacher, and he's really a throwback to um, the golden age of poetry, I guess you could say. Um, that's Alejandro Escudé, um, just a pure poet's poet. He's coming up next week, Rattlecast number 57, Tuesday, September 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I will see you then. Thanks, everybody who shared poems. Hope you have a great rest of your week, and I will talk to you soon. Good night.